Welcome to the first science session of AppGradCon. I am here to put the astro in astrobiology by talking about the first two sessions, which also happen to be the entirety of the morning session. And I will also be co-chairing throughout, so look forward to that. <laughs> Okay, so um, as a first time attendant of this meeting, I was pretty amused to see the diversity of topics just within one common theme. And this was apparently true in previous years as well, so I think it really emphasizes the identity of astrobiology as a truly interdisciplinary science field. But, you know, that being said, we do have a story right here. So my own research is on the atmospheric composition uh, modeling of a variety of exoplanet types from Earth-like planets to hot Jupiters, which are essentially Jupiters that are at one-tenth of the Mercury-Sun distance from their host star. So basically, um, what I'm trying to say here is, as somebody who is actually interested in this kind of stuff, I found that um, you know I'm somebody who wants to look at how we, like how we got these spectroscopic signals that we see when we look at planets. Um, so when we look at planets with Spitzer or J the James Webb Space Telescope or um, you know Spitzer and James Webb hasn't launched yet, so we are able to look at their spectra in the infrared and we can detect all these molecules. And of course, for the molecules to have uh, gotten there, they need to have had um, you know, things delivered on their surfaces. So obviously the delivery part, which is the topics in the middle of these two sessions, are important because that's how we get the molecules that we can see with space telescope. So in that sense, um, what we look at for exoplanets and what we know about solar systems essentially just inform each other. And the idea is that we will be combining the knowledge and eventually end up with the search for life being our ultimate goal, which is the goal of astrobiology. And in order for us to do that, to get, even get to that stage, um, so you know, we talk about the delivery process and we look at exoplanets and ultimately we want to look at analog sites on Earth for say ocean worlds like deep sea regions and we want to explore them with robotic missions and we also want to look at you know, other extreme planets where there might have been life in the past, like Mars. So talks about them will basically be the end of the session. So we're gonna go, how did everything get there? How do we look at exoplanets? And basically looking at your own solar neighborhood to characterize the extreme of biohabitable zones. So I think that's how the session here comes together. Okay, so as I mentioned, we've had all these missions, and I'm sure you know all about them. And we've had, especially we've had Kepler, uh, which was phenomenally crucial for identifying all these planets around other solar systems that are like Earth-like. And what that has meant for us is we have been able to draw some constraints, all the Goldilocks zone slash habitable zone around different types of stars. Now there's relationship for them, what one of my co-advisors actually defined that, Ravi Koparapu, and so now we can actually know the properties of the star and we can actually calculate what's the conservative habitable zone around them and we can even identify the inner habitable zone which is basically the limit, you know, beyond or rather before which there's going to be too much heat and things are just going to like boil over and not remain. And the other outer edge of the habitable zone, which is the greenhouse uh, glaciation zone where, you know, it's too cold, gases freeze out and high reflectivity albedo and you're done. Basically, the inner and outer hedges are just point of no return. Okay, so, right. So now I'm going to actually proceed to the actual warm-up talk, having introduced all this part. Okay, so let's start with some astrochemistry, since we are talking about, we are going to start with before, you know, things even formed. So once there was a star, it exploded, it reset all the chemistry, everything blew up, everything atomized, everything started from scratch. And then things condensed back to clouds of gas and dust, roughly hundreds of light years across, and then they condense into smaller and smaller core, and then we get protostars, and from protostars we get disks, and then they condense further into planetesimals. So astrochemistry is the process that happens during this whole 
ordeal. You know, once things blow up and and it begin to compress, you know, it, things get hotter, more complex molecules are formed. There's all sorts of weird chemistry driven by, by H-based ion. There's grain surface chemistry, ice chemistry. But the, essentially, the thing is, the chemistry doesn't really change, but it's really just the conditions that are rapidly changing, like density, temperature, and the fact that there's like no liquid phase throughout this process. So essentially, and we all know this by now, molecules have been here before Earth was formed. And so when Earth was formed, a large number of organics was actually delivered to the surface. And eventually, uh, we got more organics when, when we got bombarded later on. Which we, respons we, which we think is responsible for current life because that delivered like trillions of kilograms of organics that would be necessary for life to actually start. So let's get on that a little bit more. So comets are all over, right? Like we always hear about them. They're just wishing in and out. They're on a highly um, inclined plane compared to Earth's plane around the sun. So they're just crazy. Like, you, I mean, come on, you see here. So sometimes they get really close, sometimes they get really far, and then when they get really close, they can, you know, vaporize in our atmosphere, or in fact, like during the late heavy bombardment that happened giga years, four giga years ago, it basically crashed into Earth, and dur during that process, it signed a custom declaration form for ingredients of life as it was coming from a foreign place. So to all our people who've been traveling from foreign countries for this meeting, I'm sure you've had to do that. So, so did these comets, and during that process, they delivered essential, um, like small molecules, highly reactive small molecules, that was used for elementary prebiotic chemistry. So HCN has been detected in uh, comets, and the cool thing is HCN is a very simple but a very reactive molecule, and um, what that means is that when it forms a, m a number of macromolecules, not polymers yet, but just a small number of repetitive chains, it starts the pathway to chemical evolution. So you, we start getting the nucleic acid, we start getting um, basically the four bi basic uh, biomolecules, is nucleic acid, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. So basically, HCN in aqueous solution is just very versatile. It can just like repeat itself to follow all these molecules. And it creates the amino acids, which we know are essentials for like building blocks. And so, uh, yeah, so this is all interesting. And the cool thing about HCN is that it has this like crazy strong triple bond that should have survived cometary impacts. So we think like there's detectable amount of them, like which we can quantify that would have been there like right after the heavy bombardment. So let's see. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention was I mentioned Spitzer. So Spitzer is really cool because Spitzer has done a lot of things for us. So one of the things that Spitzer does is it also looks at protoplanetary disks around like other stars. And in doing so, uh, it was able to actually find some like warm evidence of warm, you know, because you can see dust in infrared. So warm carbon-rich dust at the habitable zone of another star, which basically showed that that star system also just recently underwent a heavy bombardment period. So that's cool, you know, we have evidence for heavy bombardment in other systems, which we are like, you know, it could have happened with us as well. So, right, so I talked about Spitzer. So the, everybody knows the James Webb Space Telescope is coming up, it will launch at some point, I know it keeps getting delayed. Um, so that's kind of like the new Happy Hubble, which like much better, bigger, you know, here's a size scale for comparison. And one of the cool thing is like, so, you know, it, obviously like most flagship missions, it has a lot of astrophysical goals. Also, it's going to look at protoplanet systems, and then it's also going to look at planetary systems and the origins of life, which is what we care about. So one of the telescope science goal is to study planets that could sh you know, help shed information on this origin of life. But that doesn't mean exoplanets only. It will also unravel mysteries held by objects in our own solar system, such as like from Mars outwards. Europa and Enceladus, you know, the ocean planets that may possibly harbor life, you know, under their like icy plumes, are actually one of Webb's first list of targets with guaranteed observing time. So here are some of the instruments. They're all in the infrared. And they can detect uh, like lots of molecules, but I'm not going to go like crazy deep into the detail of it. So, and so 
that brings me to my next question, is which what I work on and some of the other speakers work on is um, how do we look at exoplanets? Like how do we characterize them? So when you look at you know spectroscopic uh, measurement instruments that were on Hubble, Spitzer, and will be on the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, there are ways that they actually look at the light of planet. So when a, an exoplanet transits in our line of sight as we are looking around the star, as it passes the front of the star, it just blows up the atmosphere around it. And that process is known as primary transit. And with that, we can even identify trace gases in that atmosphere. Now, as it, and of course, you're looking at the edge of the orbit, right? you're looking at the edge of the transit, right? So you can also know the planet's size from there, so a physical characteristic. So as it goes behind the star, then, you know, it, you get the thermal radiation was blocked and then it comes out. So basically from that process, you can characterize the thermal radiation that's solely from the planet. So this process is the secondary eclipse when it goes behind the star. And uh, from this data, we are, can actually get the thermal structure of the planet. So and then there's another thing you can do as well, like if you look at the curves over here, is as they're going around, you know, they're going through different phases just like the moon, right? So this allows us to do a bit of like meteorology stuff. So we can see the cyclic variations in the thermal phase curve in the bright, like thermal brightness of the planet. And you can basically assess variation of properties that would vary with that, such as like the eccentricity, you know, how when a planet is much closer to the sun than its furthest point. And then you can, and that's also a rotation rate thing. And we also have a speaker who will talk about that too. So finally, um, since we just introduced how like the whole transit process works, this is my favorite slide. Uh, I'm sure you all know about the TRAPPIST system. So the TRAPPIST system has seven planets in it. And in 2015, three of them were discovered. And then last year, uh, four other were discovered via Spitzer Space Telescope. So yay, Spitzer, you're doing a lot for us. And then currently, three of them are considered to be in the habitable zone. So that would be E, F, G, and it's marked by green, like even in the circle, so you can know that. But honestly, like depending on the definition, this could be up to six, like, you know, up, if you really want to push the limits of like habitable zone, but I would recommend not doing that because I just talked about inner and outer being limited by how hot and cold it gets. So, but within these planets, it can go anywhere from 170 Kelvin to like 330 Kelvin. And uh, if you look at the bottom plot, so E is very similar to Earth in terms of like size density, and also it just gets about the same amount of radiation. And then there is C, which is the hotter one, uh, which is still within this range of habitability. But you know, you, we kind of question that, right? Because that's overlapping with Venus. So, uh, and we know Venus is kind of crazy right now. So. Okay, so I don't really have talk to, time to talk about anything else, but I'm sure we have, we'll have our, you know, we'll have Justin talking about a little bit about ocean worlds, and we'll have my colleague Amber Britt talking a little about Mars rovers later on. So thank you very much.